Welcome back, everyone, for our final component of the Archaeology and Futurity Conference. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our closing plenary speaker, Dr. Cornelius Holtorf. Dr. Holtorf is professor of archaeology and the director of the Graduate School in Contract Archaeology at Linnaeus University in Sweden. His diverse research interests share a, share a concern for the place of archaeology in contemporary society and its role in unknown futures. Research on monumentality and the cultural construction of the past at megalithic sites in northeastern Germany informed his 1998 dissertation from the University of Wales. His 2005 book, From Stonehenge to Las Vegas, Archaeology as Popular Culture, blurs the line between artifacts and people from the past and contemporary meaning. He's also the author of Archaeology as a Brand, The Meaning of Archaeology in Contemporary Popular Culture, in addition to co-editing Archaeology and Folklore, published in 1999, Contemporary Archaeology's Excavating Now, second edition published in 2011, and The Oxford Companion to Archaeology, second edition published in 2012. He also serves as the associate editor for the new Journal of Contemporary Archaeology. Dr. Holtorf's interest in archaeological and contemporary meaning has led to his involvement in diverse heritage-oriented projects at zoos and currently at nuclear waste facilities as part of his involvement in the Assembling Alternative Futures for Heritage project. Taking the question of archaeological futures quite seriously and practically, Dr. Holtorf's work demonst demonstrates the urgency with which we must confront archaeological futures in the present. We're very excited to welcome him here at Brown and provide our closing plenary address entitled An Archaeology of the Future. Please welcome Dr. Cornelius Holtorf. Thanks very much for the introduction. And I would like to say at the beginning that I noticed that several of the speakers um, during this event uh, mentioned at the beginning of the talks that they had some difficulties in uh, addressing um, the future and um, to make their own research relevant to, to the theme. And I'd like to say I didn't have this problem <laughs> for two reasons. Um, one of them is sort of on a slightly more personal level that um, this is the first presentation I'm have ever given in a Prezi format. So it feels like the beginning of something, and I hope it goes well. <laughs> Here you see the entire presentation already, but it'll take some time to go through that. And the second level is that I'll actually be um, addressing the future. Um, it's the title of the talk, and I'd like to lead us um, right in by showing you this image from um, the Long Now Foundation, which is based in San Francisco, which uh, is constructing at the moment, in the process, a very long process, um, a 10,000 year clock in Texas, I think. And uh, you know, archaeologists are always uh, interested in, the, in, in chronology, in measuring time and dividing up time. Now here's a very concrete way in how to measure the future at least the first 10,000 years of the future that will be taken care of uh, by this clock. And it's also making a point here, which leads us back to, to Laurent's um, talk um, at the beginning of the meeting yesterday, uh, because this is an example for a living material memory of the future. Uh, he presented a number of examples uh, of living material memory from the past that uh, is still with us and that uh, represents a um, uh, multi-durational present and a multi-temporality uh, today. And I think in this multi-temporality, you also need to include aspects of the future. And that's just one of them. It's something that is built. It's, it's in, a in a long process of building, and then it is supposed to last for 12 or 10,000 years. And it's built so that it has every chance to live that long. We don't know what will happen, but at least there's this potential. Uh, which may be interrupted in, in, in some form. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see uh, about that. So this is the sort of uh, very concrete future that I'll be addressing here with a number of um, very different examples and, 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 and uh, um, case studies. But the key question is, of course, not how long the future lasts or how we will measure it, but the key question is, will archaeology be valuable in the future? And of course, that happens to be the topic that has also been addressed a lot in this conference from a number of different angles, and everybody is very concerned with, uh, you know, what is our relevance? In fact, should there be archaeology uh, at all, maybe, in the future? And if so, how? And, uh, yeah, what's the right thing to do? 
Now this question, um, obviously it's, it, it's difficult to predict any uh, future appreciation of archaeology um, because we don't know what will happen. Maybe next few years we can foresee, but as, as if you think ahead a bit longer, it becomes ever more uh, difficult. But there's one thing I think we can be a little bit more certain about, and that is that archaeological knowledge may be able to help us communicate um, with the future. We can leave messages, and maybe we must leave messages um, for the future. And some of the examples in, in, in this talk will be, and I'll introduce that here, will be um, drawn from a project I've been working on for the last five years, um, which is a collaboration with um, the Swedish nuclear waste um, company. And they are um, constructing, um, or at the moment they are applying for a permit to construct a deep geological depository of nuclear waste. Um, and in that context, because of the liability for a very long time period to come that is uh, sort of um, inherent in such a depository, they are concerned about the question how to communicate the um, uh, content of that depository for people who are living up to a million years um, into the future. Just think of that, a million years. So they gave us the, um, they asked us to think about what does it mean to communicate with people in a million years? You know, we don't even know if Homo sapiens will still be around by that and who will be. Um, but it is a challenge which we somehow need to solve. Um, and there are several questions that are relevant to that. It, one is, of course, the material side. Which materials will actually last um, that long? Uh, a second question is, will the message last? Because if the material lasts and the message doesn't, then what have we gained? And the final one is, will the message be understood? And if it is understood, is it is understood in the way we would like to? <laughs> uh, will it uh, correspond to what we hope um, to, to communicate? Now let's look at one um, example. Now this is uh, from a nuclear site in the US. Uh, unfortunately, I've uh, forgotten where. <laughs> um, and it's not a major site. This is a, a relatively small deposit that, uh, and it's not the most um, high level uh, nuclear material. It's something much less. But the technology of communication is interesting. You see a stone with an inscription in English, caution do not dig. Buried in this area is radioactive material from nuclear research conducted here between 1943 and 49. Burial area is marked by six corner markers 100 feet from this center point. There is danger to visitors. So here you have <laughs> a very simple way of communicating with the future. And it uses stone because stone lasts. Um, and it is um, um, inscribed with um, a message that has already been altered only a few years after this was um, put into place. Now, at the moment, it can still be understood. We know what is missing and um, what the intention is of that. But you know, just imagine another 100 or 200 or 2,000 years, and um, it's far from certain that a message like this actually will reach the audience um, uh, for which it is intended. But there is some archaeological expertise in, these, um, um, in, the, in the process of constructing messages like that. On the right, you see another example from the Yucca Mountain um, discussions here in the US about this, this is where the discussion globally started in the 1980s. Um, and this is actually based on, on, an, on, an, um, on, a, on archaeological expertise because the, um, the material on which this plug is, is from which this is constructed is burnt clay. And archaeologists know there's nothing as durable as burnt clay, um, which can have messages on it. You know, the cuneiform tablets, which have been preserved not quite for a million years, but a few thousand years at least, and are readable um, today. And this is certainly another material that has every chance to survive very long. Also here, they, they chose um, uh, not to communicate in English, but in, uh, because who knows what language people will speak um, in, in, the, in, the long, in the distant future. But they communicate in a, in a symbolic um, language with a pictogram. Um, now, whether that will actually help is another matter. People will still be able to recognize the, well, the, the, the different elements on it, but for example, that the slash from the top left to the bottom right, that that means not to do something, uh, is something which is clear to us from traffic signs and so on that may not be clear to even on this, on, on this planet to everybody uh, who would see a sign like that. And the symbol of nucleation, you know, this, this wheel, that, uh, you know, um, may mean anything. Um, so it's not necessarily a solution, but it's another way of trying um, to communicate. Um, now, if the present experts fail in this task, that if we will not succeed in communicating a message like that to the future, 
Um, and then you could say we would really definitely need some really good archaeologists in the future who sort of stop before they get there, <laughs> have some sort of inclination, some gut feeling, I don't know, some tools, methodologies that tell them what to expect um, a meter lower maybe um, in the earth before they get there. So that's the starting point. Will archaeology be valuable and in what context will we succeed in, the, in this message constructing or will we rely on the skills of our um, future colleagues who um, will find maybe um, these places. If there are any archaeologists, who knows? There are good reasons maybe to stop with archaeology sooner rather than later, so um, who can tell? Now the, um, the main part of the talk will be um, about um, my claim, and that's the argument I'm going to be presenting, that archaeology is in fact of the future uh, in a number of different ways. Um, three ways. Um, so I'll present my first block here, uh, that archaeology, um, uh, one aspect within archaeology that hasn't really been explored very much, but could be, is uh, its contribution to the history of the future. Uh, secondly, I'll be talking about future making in the present in an archaeological context. And lastly, on what that both of these points mean for thinking future futures. What are the implications of that? What can we expect and how should we think? Uh, today in relation to um, the futures that will be constructed um, in the future. So what does all that mean? Let's start with the first block here, the histories of the futures. Now this is a relatively straightforward argument, I think, even though I haven't seen much of it in the literature. Now the archaeology and materiality of envisaged futures and imagined futures and planned futures is, is of course nothing but the flip side of the archaeology of memory. Uh, it's not what we perceive has happened, but it is what we would like to see uh, and how this is expressed in, in, in the material world. Let's look at a few examples. Um, there are different kinds of futures, of course, and I cannot present all possible options here. This is just a snapshot of a, of a, of a few possibilities. Optimistic futures, and the examples I'm giving here, they're all from the modern world, but of course you could take from different periods all kinds of things. Um, now to continue with the nuclear um, connection, uh, this is uh, after the war, uh, one of the earliest um, imaginations of what um, nuclear power would allow us to do and how it would solve a lot of our problems. And uh, this is an image uh, in Albuquerque, it's a, um, a museum for nuclear technology and, and, and it's taken that. It's an atomic power plant, within 50 years they expected then uh, cyclotron generators like these will provide unlimited atomic energy and of course completely safe and cheap and available to everybody and solves our global issues everywhere. Now it didn't quite turn out that way but at that time this is what people expected and I should say a lot of these op optimistic futures or any future some of them did happen and many did not happen just the same with memory some reflect what happened and some do not but there are reasons it's contextualized there are reasons why people imagine certain things and it has consequences also it affects the way the course of history develops it, it influences people what they perceive what hopes they are what expectations they have. Then here at the bottom you see two other examples. Uh, of course, one that's not that long ago, uh, Concords, you know, when I was a child, <laughs> we all expected that, you know, it's gonna be supersonic uh, flight, that is the future, you know, or, or space shuttle is another example. This was supposed to be the future and terrible things happened, accidents, and it was deemed to be unsafe and it stopped. And uh, very suddenly, unexpectedly, the decision was taken, this is not no longer the future. Now we move into a different direction. Or, um, uh, Tomorrowland in, in, in Disney, uh, reflecting in the 50s and 60s, the optimism how um, the car culture would be completely unproblematic and uh, allow us to um, be mobile. Um, and uh, the in this is before the environmental movement where all these issues um, were not um, on the agenda. And what these have in, in common is that these, all these three futures draw on, um, or they emphasize opportunities that arise due to modern technologies. And maybe uh, one was too optimistic about some of the um, possibilities uh, of technology at the time. But there we are. That's what people generally um, believe. So this is one future. Now, yes, another one, the opposite. They're also pessimistic futures, of course, people who foresee doomsday and apocalyptic visions and, and, and so on. And an interesting one is this very early depiction from 1813. This is Sloane's Bank of England as a ruin, which is a famous painting, has often been, been shown. Uh, and I think you may just 
maybe you can make out what what to see on it. So this is uh, at the time when the building was erected, when it was new. This was a vision of what it might look like um, many years later as a ruin, and it looks like some sort of uh, Roman city. Maybe it's a romantic um, image of what the building would look like uh, when it no longer was was in use. So uh, already at the time when it was built, you know, you, this is something. Today, people don't do that anymore. Um, but here's a vision of a future that is not hopeful. It's one of where things end and, 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 and collapse. This is another one. This is um, an image that is actually not from the, uh, from the reference I give, but the, the book contains similar images. Paul Virilius, uh, Bunker Archaeology from 1975, a study of the um, concrete fortification, the Atlantic Wall and the West Wall in, uh, along the borders, the Atlantic borders um, uh, of Europe. Um, well, um, the, um, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the German troops prepared uh, for the attack by the, by the Allies. And this is, of course, a future where they were afraid. How can we protect us from what is going to happen, what actually did happen <laughs> uh, ev eventually? Uh, very thick concrete walls. And, and, and they were so solidly built that they're still there. And in many cases, they gradually sink into the sand. They're very evocative structures that tell us about the fears uh, and the expectations uh, of the people who um, lived there, as, at least periodically, um, and, um, and the politicians behind it, uh, of course, also. And here's another example, and again, this comes from the, from, from the nuclear um, uh, context. And uh, actually, this is rather interesting, because when the, um, as I said, in the, in the context of the um, American discussions about the Yucca Mountain, uh, but also about the WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, uh, that has been constructed and is in use now, in, uh, uh, there was a lot of debate, including uh, anthropologists and archaeologists and uh, science fiction writers and, and, and artists, a very broad, very, uh, still very interesting debate to read their documents. And in that process, I think it's the late 1980s approximately, um, they um, had a competition. How should we communicate to people in a million years um, that th this site is not uh, where you should dig uh, or search for water or, or should drill down for whatever reason? Um, and some of that is based on messages, like I showed you examples earlier that you just write in plain language, and maybe in different languages, maybe with pictograms and so on. But this is another approach, and this is the landscape of thorns. Um, and this is an attempt to evoke emotions in people through material culture. So it's really very um, topical to many uh, contemporary theoretical discussions in, in archaeology. The senses, the emotions, um, how do we have a, can develop a, um, a complete picture of uh, what it means to be human? And uh, what else, how do we bring that together with the material world? So here the intention is to construct these thorns from in a very durable material which will last under the specific conditions in, the, in, in this area and which will make fe people uncomfortable when they get there. They just don't want to be there. It doesn't tell them anything. It doesn't tell them there's danger or don't dig or, you know, be careful. No, it says, you know, um, get confused, you know. We want you to, to leave here, um, you know, um, get out of here. I don't know if you've seen the, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, which has a very similar sort of, um, it affects your emotions, it affects you feel, um, you don't know what's going on. You, it's not pleasant to be there. And it's very interesting how material culture can affect um, things. So this is one, another approach in a similar direction. So these then are pessimistic futures, and, and, and they share that they're all about uh, they expressed fears and, and risks, um, perceptions of what could happen and, and, and will happen, and, and in some cases did happen, um, and you prepare yourself for that in, in, in some form. Now, in the history of the future, I've um, um, somehow um, got the idea that maybe there are also key years, certain years where, um, which are more significant than, than yeah, but, but the things come together, and it seems to me that 1972 is one of these key years in, uh, in recent years, uh, in, in, the, in this cent last century, uh, for in, in the history of the future. Um, because there are three sig very significant um, events happening, uh, um, happened to have happened just in this one year. One is the Club of Rome's limits, of course, which is the beginning of the environmental movement and led to everything with Rio and, and, and the whole, all the uh, climate change debates is ultimately a consequence of a process that started at that time and that expressed worries um, about what's going on on the planet and called for responsibility and even the Anthropocene, which we heard about earlier, sort of is the last culmination of this particular kind of thinking. 
Um, and then the year also saw the UNESCO's World Heritage Convention, um, which is also about concern for the destruction of heritage, but it takes a, a, a more constructive view maybe, because it proposes that in order to solve this problem as far as the heritage is concerned, we need a global effort to conserve certain sites um, and protect them, uh, so that they will not be suffering from whatever um, we can expect. And finally, uh, this is also the year when NASA's Pioneer 10 space probe was launched. Now, what has that got to do with the future, you, you, you may wonder. And um, I'll talk a bit about space um, now, and also come back to that later. Um, now, um, the Pioneer is, uh, is, is one of the few space probes that has left the solar system. Um, so it's on its way to reach an unlimited future, or nearly <laughs> unlimited uh, future, which in a way puts humanity in its place in the universe, you know, in the most, in the biggest imaginable scale that there is. Um, but let me give you some more context on, on, on these space probes. There are four space probes that uh, until recently um, um, yeah, have, have left the solar system, not more. Uh, all the others are on various um, trajectories within the solar system. And these are Pioneer 10 and 11 and Voyager um, 1 and 2. And here you see their current locations. Um, so um, they are nowhere near from each other. And if you had this in three dimensions, you would, would become even <laughs> clearer. They're going at com different speeds and completely different um, uh, directions. And uh, as you know, the, 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 the Pioneer um, image um, reflects um, one vision of um, what it means um, to be human for whoever may find that. Um, and of course, partly that's, that's, that's a message sent to intelligence that may be or may not be out there, but it's also a message that is sent to people on Earth, to all of us. And I think you've all seen this image before and, and heard the critiques, uh, very justified critiques about it. It reflects a particular expectation of a universal, global, uh, uh, limitless future at that time. Let's communicate the essence of what it means to be human. I think that's what they tried to do. And uh, there was a consensus, at least in the people who were responsible at that time, that this means we focus on the biology. Uh, it's our nature that is the most important thing. And so we show these, we show some natural elements, some physics and chemistry and astronomy and so on. Uh, and we show these naked people and the man with the um, greeting gesture that maybe not everybody would understand as, uh, as greeting, not even on Earth, um, and the women to the side standing with a different step and, uh, and so on. Uh, you can see the, um, well, it's so easy to critique the gender messages that are in this message. It is so easy for us now. It was not, of course, to the people who did it at the time, um, but it's a classic um, image now. Now here's the um, um, Voyager, and uh, they send a golden record. It was the time of records, so they send a, a golden record. And, and um, again, it's an attempt to communicate what it means to be human um, into space. But this is a few years later, and people had thought more about uh, what had maybe gone wrong with the uh, pioneer. And, and they were focusing more on culture. Um, so it's a much richer um, message. And uh, it says what is, what is on it here. It, it contains uh, recorded audio. 117 pictures of the planet, different elements, greetings in 54 different human languages, and songs of the humpback whales. So <laughs> it's the idea to represent nature as well. Um, and it also has uh, some other sounds, and then it comes, it has 90 minutes of some of the world's greatest music. And I know some of the background that, that there are three, men, three people mentioned at the bottom. Uh, Frank Drake, Carl Sagan, and um, Bernard um, Oliver. And he and, 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 and this group and, and a number of their closest friends, it's like six or seven people, they did the entire Voyager message in six weeks. From the moment they heard they could do it until the launch of the rocket was six weeks. So this is, you know, how can we fix this fast? And uh, this, there is not a particular extensive process uh, which leads behind the selection of the music. It's these individuals' favorite music. And in one or two cases, copyright was too difficult, so that was left out. <laughs> Just imagine copyright <laughs> for a message sent into space, uh, which is more than ironic. And maybe it's those songs that did not get copyright clearance that are really tell us most about <laughs> what it means to be human, or, uh, or it meant at that time. Um, anyway, so this is another way of sending a different message, but it also is supposed to reflect the best of humanity or who we really are. 
Um, and I think you see the connection to how the, um, this challenge to um, address uh, an unlimited future almost, how that um, brings an energy in, into people and really to think, what does it mean to be human? How do we solve this particular task? So this was, these are elements um, of the um, histories of the future. And all of them, if you, wanna, if you analyze that, uh, there, there's some recurring themes in that. And, and, and they are about the possibilities of, of powerful technology, its risks, and the question of accountability that always uh, crop up, especially in, 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 in recent centuries. Now my second point is about um, what, um, how do we make, uh, oh, sorry, now it comes. <laughs> Um, how do we uh, make the future in the present through archaeology? And archaeologists contribute to future making in a number of different ways, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through them. They are to do with knowledge, with um, preservation of heritage objects, um, and also with, uh, with a number of other realms where archaeological expertise is, is coming in now. And they draw on modern technologies, um, but again, they're linked very often to this notion of taking responsibility that is so um, paramount, really, in, in, in our age um, right now. So let me just very quickly give a few examples for that. Uh, I'm sure there are many more, but these are just some show the variety in which the future is made uh, today. Um, now, one aspect is that the w in the way we accumulate knowledge about the past, that this provides us insights about trends for the future. And um, one example is, of course, our libraries. Um, this is the Haddon Library in, 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 uh, at Cambridge. And, well, I think you have libraries like this here and in many places, and it just is the accumulated knowledge of a, of a whole discipline, really, that is there to be used by subsequent scholars and students to learn and build on that and eventually help us understand one aspect or several aspects of the world a little bit better. Um, but they're also very applied um, notions. Now, this is a, a very simple diagram, and it reflects um, just one um, um, body of um, evidence that, that there is. This is just in the, 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 the number of world population. Uh, and it's so simple, but it's also so clear in the trend you see in that, how the population is rising. And of course, there are varieties between different parts of the world, and you can depict that also. Um, but it's a very clear trend here only over 2,000 years, but you can make this graph much longer, um, see what happens. So you can predict certain things, you know, not unlimited long. Obviously, there may come the breaking point. Um, people argue when that may be, and in fact, we are maybe already beyond it. Who knows? Um, but it, uh, the risk is very clear in where this curve is um, uh, probably going to continue or wants to continue. And it, there are also other issues that people are talking about, and, and a lot of them are environmental. Climate change has similar curves for temperature rises and uh, other and, and environmental um, trends. And more and more people see this as one of the main challenges in archaeology to uh, address uh, very concrete issues of concern, often in relation to, in relation to the environment. Um, and I found, yeah, I found one quote that expresses that um, in recent years from Sander van der Leeuw in, in, in a major article um, he wrote together with uh, a large number of um, his colleagues, where he says that we must focus our historical efforts on the future rather than the past. We must concentrate on learning about future possibilities from history. The new approach outlines a number of possible trajectories from the present into the future and then asks the following questions. What is the future result we desire and what do we need to, uh, to achieve that? And I think today also we heard a number of other examples. It was not environmental, but other issues where similar questions um, come up. So this really seems to be an issue that uh, is on the agenda in, uh, throughout archaeology, really, in, in, in different domains um, within it. Here's a second example, which is now um, not um, about so moving on now from, from the uh, accumulating knowledge point to the point of preservation um, of heritage. And this is... Um, wonderful poster which I think illustrates uh, a way of thinking that we've seen, all of us have seen in many contexts, that is part of many policy documents, of slogans, of societies, um, politicians like to argue like that, in this case 25 years of preserving the past for the future. Um, sometimes it says that we are preserving the past for the benefit of future generations, even UNESCO documents have phrases like that, and one can wonder. Um, and you can do that, of course, in different ways, either in situ um, or by record. And I think uh, you're familiar with the, uh, this distinction, how archaeologists um, work. Now, one can wonder 
um, how this claim, or to what extent this claim reflects uh, a mantra that is repeated for its own sake um, very often. And in fact, there are studies uh, which show that it may just be just that. <laughs> that um, and I, like we can also read interviews with people in several countries, about 60 interviews in total with heritage experts, and not a single person knew what they meant by preserving heritage for the future. Everybody says that this is what we do, but when you ask him, yeah, which, which future, how do you mean? How is this gonna work? Nobody has ever thought about that. Very senior people, um, even at UNESCO, who are clever in every respect, now all uh, areas of practice, and they say, you know, what an interesting question. I've never in my life thought about that before. This is the pattern, and uh, which sort of seems to underline this claim that it really is a mantra, most often. But there is potential, of course, it could be different. And there are um, examples where there seems to be a genuine commitment to impact the future. Uh, there may not be too many, um, but there are some. And I just want to show you two, two different ones from major sites where uh, different approaches, slightly different approaches are taken and which uh, illustrate the potential to really impact the future through the preservation and uh, presentation of heritage. Now, the first one, um, is Auschwitz, um, which is of course a site everybody knows what w w what happened there, and which is, uh, receives many visitors and um, uh, has been open to the public for many years also. And if you, uh, I went about a year ago and uh, documented um, the um, phrases and references, to, uh, the explicit references to the future on the site. And they all share a, a sentiment that I think we've all come across many, time, that many times, that um, this is uh, a place where we want to remember what happened so that it doesn't happen again. But essentially, it's about memory. It's about um, not forgetting. Um, it's about keeping it in the, in the back of our minds, what, what once happened. Um, and the risk, of course, is that it might happen again under different circumstances. And to prevent that, or one, asp one contribution to prevent that from happening, we keep the memory al alive. Um, and a different, um, I found a different approach to, to, to the future in another major site, and that is uh, Hiroshima. Uh, also known to everybody, and we know what happened there. And, um, and here you see a very different approach. This is not about memory throughout the entire site, very little references. It's not about commemoration, what happened, and keeping the memory alive. They took a completely different view. Um, uh, for example, here, the peace bell, which is there. Um, it rings um, every August, uh, I can't, I must read to read that here. Um, the bell is rung during the peace memorial ceremony every August 6th by a representation, representative of a family of, of an uh, A-bomb victim as a hope for world peace. And you see that in the other quotes also. The Pope was there in 1981. Um, to remember Hiroshima is to commit oneself to peace. It's not about memory. It's about constructing a better world. It's a commitment to, uh, to a world where, where wars no longer happen. Uh, not only at atomic wars, uh, but no wars. Uh, it's a commitment to peace. So here we have a positive vision for the future that is sort of inbuilt in the very site. That's the message people take with them. And it's very different from Auschwitz uh, and, of course, many other um, heritage sites. So these are... Um, examples for how the future is made at heritage sites uh, that are preserved uh, in the present. Um, very often it's a mantra, it's a phrase, that means little, but there are exceptions um, where you can see that uh, people have thought about um, uh, a strategy and how to uh, create um, certain behavior, or certain processes and practices um, that will uh, impact the future and contribute to um, make it a little bit better than it might otherwise um, be. Now let me give you some other examples for uh, activities that are not inherently uh, necessarily archaeological, but where archaeological expertise comes in and informs um, the way they make the future there. Now, um, these are novel forms of fragile heritage preserved for the future and very often also anticipating risks. And um, one example here is the, in the, the, the central image is the seed bank in Svalbard. You may have read about that. It's been in, in many uh, in the media uh, throughout. And this is uh, there are several seed banks on the world. This is one of them, which is in a permafrost area on Svalbard, where they keep samples from um, around the world uh, seeds that are considered important uh, to have preserved um, after 
mishaps. For example, now in the Syrian context, there were certain people who uh, withdrew certain um, seats again because they had lost their own records uh, due to um, the war um, at the moment. This was the first time actually something had been withdrawn again regularly. Now, archaeologists work with these, and I can uh, say that because I'm part of a project where we have uh, met um, the responsibles for um, Seed Bank. Only a month ago, they came to Stockholm. Um, and you should think, you know, they are professionals. They know how to build, how to deal with their seeds and preserve them, and, and they do all that right. But at the end of our meeting, um, the person responsible for the Seed Bank, a Norwegian, um, he said, um, I learned something from you archaeologists that I hadn't thought about, because, yes, we have... We, we know how to preserve seeds, and that's all taken care of. But we never thought that as important as the seeds is it to preserve the information about the seeds. We cannot just preserve seeds, because if this is for the long term, I mean, now everybody knows, uh, in a, a thousand years, you know, uh, we may have a seed and the Latin name, and, you know, we know where it's coming from, maybe, but we don't know what to do with it. So d to preserve the information about the seed is as important as the seed itself. And he said he had never thought about that. They have no strategy for that. And this is uh, an outcome of um, people like him meeting a group of archaeologists and heritage experts and just talking to each other. And it, you know, it just emerged from discussions because other people in this group were thinking like this. And he thought, hang on, you know, we, we've never considered that. And here's another example. Oh, yeah, that became big. Uh, and um, now this is um, again. I've shown you. Oops. Uh, I don't know. I've shown you earlier um, pictures from the uh, nuclear waste deposits that and, and the communicative efforts that are being taken. Now this is um, an archaeological site um, of the future. This is the plan for the final repository of um, uh, high-level nuclear waste in Sweden. And the process has come quite far and will probably be the second country in the world that will get the permit to build this structure within a year or two. The first country is Finland. They've just uh, received that uh, permission. So it looks almost like an Egyptian grave. It could be inside a pyramid with all these, you know, you see obvious these um, archaeological uh, connotations. Um, and, um, and here, as I said, the nuclear waste company, in the process of building that, they again invited us as archaeologists to work with them and think through these questions. You know, what, how do we perceive of the future? What, are, what, what approach will work and what will certainly not work? And, and how do we have to address our, uh, and you know, do justice to the responsibility we have for future generations? Because if we don't address that properly, um, um, it's not only that we don't act responsibly, but it's also that we, we may never get the permit for good reasons. Um, and the um, local municipalities, the, uh, the people, the community there is also concerned about this issue, um, of course. So this is another, this is the nuclear sector, which is also suddenly um, listening to, to, to archaeologists and wants to have us involved um, in some way. And I think there are other examples. Um, and then finally, and now I'm returning to space. Um, there is, uh, how do we make futures um, today? Um, now, the ultimate um, future making uh, are universal futures, uh, what I've discussed briefly earlier in relation to the Pioneer and Voyager. Uh, and you could say this uh, is world heritage um, beyond UNESCO. <laughs> um, this is the world heritage that sort of is in the world, in the universe, or will be. Um, and um, there's a new project um, now that's been going on for a number of years, but we're still waiting for the final permission from NASA. Uh, this is the fifth space message that uh, hopefully will, uh, will be sent uh, into space, and it's probably the last one that any of us will encounter during our lifetime, because NASA projects are very long-term and takes a l many decades to plan them, and there's nothing else in the works at the moment, so we can predict it's like for the next 40 or 50 years there will be no more space message. Uh, this is the last chance, and it's, um, this is also, I mean, like always, this is adapted to um, the time um, at which, um, uh, in which we live. It's, it's our ages um, um, space message, which means it's a digital message. Um, and those of you following the news and so on, they know, of course, that the New Horizons uh, space probe has already left Earth 10 years ago, and in fact passed Pluto uh, last summer, and is now on its way to, um, uh, the, the, the in the process now of, of applying for an extension of the mission so that it will also visit a few places in the Kuiper Belt. And after that, um, it looks like there's every opportunity. Um, Alan Stern, the principal investigator, is behind this message project also. There's every opportunity, every chance that um, the project will get the um, permission to upload uh, about 100 megabytes of data 
uh, through the communication channels that, that exist um, onto this um, spaceship. So and if you go on the internet and s Google that, you'll, you'll, you'll find this web page uh, where um, they are now um, gathering support and interest in order to be ready when the time comes. And uh, through um, some coincidence, I'm a member of the advisory board of, of that project, and it's great fun to be able to think about um, universal heritage issues and you know, uh, this particular future from an archaeological um, perspective. So they are asking people to um, contribute to this message. Um, it's going to be um, uh, 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 crowd-sourced this time, the message. They want to involve as many people as possible from around the globe. It's not going to be five individuals and their wives or something, but it, this is going to be a, a different effort, which makes uh, an, an attempt to be much more um, inclusive. Um, so it is, again, a message sent into space, but also, and mainly, I would say, a message sent to Earth, uh, which mobilizes people and uh, yeah, it makes us all think about uh, humanity and, and who we are. Uh, now, there are many different challenges, and I just want to name them. We could give a lecture on, on, on all of that, but not now. Um, different strategies. The, uh, the starting point for many people in the project is that we should carefully select representations of our one Earth uh, in a, an exclu in inclusive way as possible, of course. Um, but um, that we should uh, send images or sound files or even some, some short uh, videos that show different things um, on the Earth. And that's one approach. Now, I find some of the other approaches more interesting. Um, we can, for example, consider sending metaphors or symbols of humanity in, in, uh, into space. And it doesn't bother me too much that metaphors may not be understandable for uh, ET. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, how big are the chances and uh, that ET will understand anything <laughs> we send and that they are um, not all that hopeful that uh, this is actually reaches um, um, a receiver. And it's much more so that um, we talk to ourselves, we talk to other people on this planet and future generations, of course, on this planet. And they will understand a number of metaphors uh, and symbols. For example, um, I've been thinking uh, today with the discussions on capitalism and the injustices in the world and human suffering and, and, and all of that. Now, if this is also uh, elementary uh, about uh, being human uh, today, and maybe uh, messages about that should also be represented um, on this. And how do you do that? Um, how do you send a process into space? How do you send a process of uh, liberal capitalism, for example, if you want, uh, into space? And uh, I don't have the answer, but I think that should be the challenge. Um, to get uh, to open up this um, project for alternative ways of representing things that are meaningful to all of us and important for all of us, uh, but cannot necessarily be easily expressed in a single image. Um, another way of um, trying to represent uh, the entire globe is, of course, an inclusive decision making that uh, it's not just the experts uh, being involved, but as many people as possible, um, which I think uh, will happen. But it's people who have access to the internet um, at this point, because there's just no way <laughs> of reaching everybody uh, on Earth. And there's also still this issue that NASA needs to approve everything. And we know some of the sensibilities that exist there, you know, no naked people and <laughs> um, so on. Um, and how do you realign that with the, with the ambition to present something that uh, you know, shows the whole variety of uh, what it means to be human. Um, and finally, how do you deal with allowing different voices? Should you send contradictory messages? Should you say, you know, we, we have, you know, here's the earth and, and there are different ways of looking at that. And from this angle, it would look like this and from this like that. And they, con and they have, you know, opposing views. Um, I think it would be um, elementary in many ways to, to allow that and, and to resist um, the streamlining of, of a message which somehow uh, gives the impression that everybody's agreed on something. Um, but how do you do that so that it um, still becomes meaningful and that different uh, voices can talk to each other and, and about each other? So these are some of the issues we are, we in, in which we're making a universal future and are preparing to make a universal future um, at the moment. So this then was my second point on how f um, future making in the present happens, uh, or some examples for how this happens um, through archaeology um, today. And now let's like, let me take this one, uh, one step further and think about um, future futures. Um, now in the future, preserved material remains will of course be enlisted uh, to make future futures then also. Um, and one issue we need to ask is which of them will still be available uh, or uh, accessible, uh, available and accessible um, in the future. And you've all seen 
uh, headlines um, like this one, um, which is a very dramatic language that here an, um, a destroyed um, mural in, in Damascus is described as in terms of destruction of antiquities as a loss for all eternity. You know, again, you have these universal references. Um, and some, of some things get destroyed, so they will not be accessible in the future. And this is a recent image, what uh, Palmyra looks like um, today, um, uh, compared with um, uh, what it looked like um, before the uh, recent uh, destructions. And I think you've all seen these images recently in, uh, in the media. So some things don't make it physically. Um, and of course, other things may make it physically, but they're no longer accessible in terms of interpretation. Their meaning is lost. Now here you see an, um, an expert looking at a disk with a, in, a, in, a, in a writing that uh, people at the time can no longer, they, st they speak code, uh, you know, this, uh, what are they called? In barcode a language. Um, and they have the object, but can no longer make sense of it. Um, and that's another way in which accessibility may be lost. Um, but of course, the more importantly, um, the question is um, not only, or maybe not only, mostly, uh, how to preserve uh, something, but um, how it will be valued, and whether it will be valued in the way we would like it to be valued, and whether it will, make, will be able to make a positive contribution to society in the future. And this question is similarly significant for the nuclear waste sector as it is uh, for, for the heritage sector. I mean, we are also preserving things for the future. That's what it says in the legislation. That's what many of us believe in. That's what we try to do. But it only works if we can be sure that it will have a benefit in, 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 in the future. If we cannot make that plausible, then the whole thing falls. The logic is no longer applicable. Now let's look a bit more deep, uh, a little bit deeper into this um, question. Um, now the particular value of an object may be a reason for material transformation also. It may lead to a very thorough um, shift in what a thing um, becomes. Now, we've uh, seen Ai Weiwei earlier uh, today, and he's great for many things, and of course it's um, complex, meaning that he communicates also through that, which is a lot to do about China, cultural politics, and so on. But I here use it in a, in a different context, this, this famous artwork, Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn from 95. He dropped um, an urn in front of a photographer in a very sort of um, casual gesture, as if you know, it, it doesn't matter. And um, I've read in one of the um, uh, appropriate um, literature that in fact he dropped two urns because the photographer missed it the first time around. <laughs> These are real urns. These are urns that he owned, that he had bought somewhere, presumably legally, for all we know, uh, his property, which he destroys. Now, can he do that? Um, and what happens as he does that? Uh, because Ai Weiwei is a big name <laughs> in the art world. And by doing that, arguably, the shirts and the representation of the act of destruction gains in value. It doesn't lose value. <laughs> uh, the object becomes famous because it was dropped by Ai Weiwei. It doesn't disappear from the planet of the Earth. It just is transformed into something else. It becomes an artwork. And the story continues here. This is Manuel Salvesberg from Switzerland. Uh, in his work, Fragments of History, from 2012. Now, he bought one of Ai Weiwei's urns. And if you look carefully, you see in a moment, I have another picture. Um, it says Coca-Cola on the urn, which Ai Weiwei had painted on the ancient urn. And he bought one of them and dropped it and created a similar sort of image. And Ai Weiwei was furious, it says. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, it was legal, it couldn't do anything about it, there was n nothing wrong with that. But now it goes, you know, it perpetuates, the logic is continued. Um, is this an act of, of loss or is it an act of creation? Uh, it certainly is an act of appreciation of both of Ai Weiwei and of the vases in a particular context. Now, and here you, you, you see what I'm getting at, how complicated this becomes to be assured of a value of something in the future when uh, all these things may happen along the way. And these are not acts of vandalism. Uh, or not, I mean, there's much more to it than, than, than the Vandal Act that, that you see depicted, uh, maybe like that. Um, yeah, here's the question. Did these transformations result in a loss or a creation of value? And here you see one of the urns, what it, uh, the way they looked like, the way he trans, uh, has transformed them already um, before. Now let's, let me give you another example. Um, Trinidad Rico wrote a very interesting paper a couple of years ago. 
Um, and uh, this deals with the 2004 tsunami, which destroyed much of Banda Aceh in, in Indonesia. And here's one image of what this looks like, and this is quite a recent image. Um, now, when Trinidad um, returned um, years later, um, she found that the disaster heritage had um, developed, which witnessed of a historical turning point and was helping to bring local populations together in their efforts to overcome loss and plan for the future. So things had been destroyed, but the act of destruction and the heritage of that destruction became something positive. It helped people in, in acknowledging what had happened and overcoming it and going further. And um, tsunami boats, there's several of them, they become uh, a heritage of its own. It's not just a loss. Of course, it uh, has also destroyed things. A lot of things were, were destroyed through that. But here it becomes uh, an, a symbol of, uh, of, it becomes part of the heritage, becomes a symbol of something that, that, that points into the future, becomes a new legacy that is being mobilized um, in, in, a, in a different um, context. So it's not so clear that the destruction uh, that also was part of the tsunami, of course, that this was entirely, int has to be seen in terms of loss. It's also an act of creation, uh, just in a different way. Right. Now, Rico says that the future heritage, um, future heritage sites in Aceh, they are being built rather than rebuilt. And I think that's a very interesting way of, um, of putting it. Heritage sites are being built in every present. Um, they're not rebuilt all the time. We, we are, con we are contrib contributing to heritage. We are continuing the history. I mean, that is the whole point of heritage, that it reflects the course of history and what happens under different circumstances. And it raises, of course, the question, do we need to think differently about our own future making? Um, how can we make heritage future-proof and thus sustainable? These are issues of sustainability. How can we create something that will lose its meaning, lose its significance through an act that, uh, in this case, nobody could control? Um, a tsunami, and maybe cultural events, and maybe wars, and maybe um, all kinds of things. How future-proof is it to preserve heritage when we don't take this into account, when we don't uh, create um, um, processes and or structures, institutionalize the uh, uh, um, a preparedness for change and transformation? I think that's the challenge to achieve sus sustainable sustainability. It's illusionary to think that we can conserve everything as it is. That's not the point of history, and it's not the point of heritage. So we need to create something else. But how do we do that? It's not an easy, uh, the heritage sector has never dealt with that. There is no, we, we realize that there's um, variety in space, uh, different perceptions of heritage and p different claims and so on. But we haven't yet come to grips with the fact that there's also variety in time <laughs> and that heritage changes over time dramatically and this is not only a negative thing. Uh, this is part of the very logic of heritage and history. Now, um, uh, a recent um, book on these issues contains a paper by uh, Stephanie uh, Laval, um, and um, she makes an interesting distinction between two types of conservation. She says basically that these sort of events, terrible events, they make us question um, how the heritage sector thinks uh, and how we work. And uh, she makes this distinction between fortress conservation and fluid conservation. Now, fortress conservation is the one we're all familiar with. Th that's the conservation that builds fortresses, that anticipates risks and tries to prevent loss as much as possible, uh, preserve the status quo as much as we can. Now, fluid conservation is the alternative. That's what she suggests comes out of examples like um, Banda Aceh here, the tsunami boats. Uh, this means we need to adapt to loss. We need to be ready and willing to create new, leg new legacies all the time as things um, change. And it just uh, puts on its head many of the principles that the conservation world is governed by and many of the policy documents that are out there in, 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 in conservation. But this is what thinking about the future can do to you, uh, that you realize in order to um, create sustainable futures, you need to rethink um, the very logic of what you're doing. I'm not going to go through that, i just make a reference, um, because um, um, there's an, an, an article just published in Antiquity, uh, literally weeks ago, by um, Nathan Schlanger and um, two other um, authors from France, um, where they make a very similar point, but in relation to the Fukushima uh, disaster and the way um, they are um, 
thinking about heritage now and how um, they are arguing for the preservation of some of the destructions, similar boat pictures you get also here, uh, but also the destroyed reactors uh, and so on. So that it can, can become a similar sort of symbol for a new beginning, for a turning point in Japanese history and help the community to move into different directions. Um, which is quite different to the dominant way in which heritage has been dealt in the aftermath of disaster in Japan, where they tried to cut losses and, and rescue um, information that, uh, you know, and a rescue archaeology, preventive archaeology kind of context, um, um, tried to preserve the knowledge that is contained. Whereas here, those three advocate that we should think about the disaster as, as it in itself as an heritage um, <coughs> event, which um, we need to. Um, memorialize um, with a view to the future. So these are the three ways in which um, I've argued that archaeology is of the future. Uh, and I have, especially last one, that there are implications for what that means for practice and how we um, think today about what we should or should not be doing uh, with heritage and with archaeology um, today. And I hope that it has become clear to the readers of my newspaper what all these different categories mean. And, um, or at least what I, <laughs> uh, what I mean to me, and, and maybe also stimulated you to think about what they mean to you. So this then um, is the talk um, on an archaeology um, of the future. And what I should say at the very end is a word of thanks that uh, the Heritage Future Projects, which, are, which I mentioned, is an inspiration for all these um, thoughts. And uh, I'd also like, of course, again, to, think, uh, to thank uh, Matt and uh, Joukowsky Institute here for the invitation and the hospitality we've all received. And um, with that, I say thank you very much for the attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we do have some time for questions and comments. I know you guys are really itching to get over to the Fetty Wap concert that'll be starting soon. Uh, so before you head over there, if there are any comments and questions, we're happy to field them at this point. Not all at once. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Cornelius. That was very interesting. Um, the question of anticipation, uh, leaving room for the unanticipated. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm always struck by the, the pioneer and the voyager because the first one goes out and you have two humans standing there. And then the next one goes out, with Carl Sagan and his friends, and they have whale songs and they have elephants. They have these other creatures that we share this world with, right? And now the, the new message is up again. And how are you anticipating for those others that we share this planet with, and what role do they play? Also, in the context of heritage, uh, which, is, which I think is fundamental, how do we include these others that have been evicted out of all our cities and we don't live with in the way that we formerly did? Um, what role do they come in? And this is just a, a, a general worry about heritage um, as well, you know, whose heritage? Uh, and I know you worry about this too, but just to throw it out there. Thanks so much for the very thought-provoking talk. One of the things that I wanted to return to is a question that you posed to us about 1972. I was trying to think about the oil crisis um, and David Harvey. Um, and 1972, that didn't start happening until 1973. Um, so that's not the answer. But it, raised, it raises a broader question about why now? Why are we interested in futurity now? What is it that's really compelling these questions? I think Chris has offered some answers about it. That's something else I'd like to put out there. And I'm also wondering wonder, wonder what your speculations about that might be. Thank you. Well, I, I don't, I mean, what, what drives history? I mean, the, I think that's a clear trend. Um, uh, in fact, a much longer trend than just a few years or so. You see already how the, uh, both the future and the past expand <laughs> dramatically over the last few hundred years. And, and this process is still continuing as we're going ever further back in time, with the origin of the universe and every, um, 
longer into the future also with an increased sense of responsibility and worry about where will it all end uh, and so on. I cannot explain it, um, but it's something that we've, we've certainly 1972 is one high, high point and it's still continuing along those lines. I don't know if anybody can explain it or has an idea on why that happened uh, just now. And it seems to be, it's, it's, it's probably bigger than Western, right? I think it's just really the concern is global, even though maybe it comes from here. I don't, I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, I, I would like to, to, to tell you a, a story. The, the writer, Georges Perec, he, he had a very uh, bizarre uh, plan. His idea was to, to choose uh, 10, uh, 12 places in Paris to sit down, there are 12 months in a year, so each month to sit down in a cafe, have a glass of something, and just record what's going on. To put that into an envelope, to glue it, and then the next month to go somewhere else. And the idea was to, to keep doing that for 12 years. So you end up with 12 stories. So unfortunately, he died before being able to achieve that. But what, what is very uh, striking, and it's very close to what you have been talking about, is this is something quite uh, uh, astonishing. You're creating a story in sending message to the future. This is, this is what, what, what he was doing. Uh, the idea that uh, you, you, you don't remember what you have been writing the, 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 the year before, and in fact, the, the, the story is reconstructing itself uh, af after that. And, 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 and of course, it was completely unable to predict in which direction it was going to. It's a bit like the, the Warhol boxes, you know? You, every week, he was, uh, was piling stuff into, into a box. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating process in which, in recording the present, in fact, in, in you're sending messages to the future, but at the same time, you're, you're creating a story. Absolutely. So that, that's, I mean, I emphasize process in, in, in one context in relation to the message, but um, there's also the process, what we're doing right now in thinking about this, uh, that is also a story that will be told eventually in a much bigger context. And so, so that's absolutely um, the case. And what, what I think another heritage aspect that the, the, the space project needs to deal with um, is, is its own legacy man management. And that was badly handled before. They thought that the job was done with the Voyager when the message was sent. But of course it's not. This is only sort of a, a middle point at some point. Something happened, an event, and then it continues. Because you need to tell the story in a particular way and, and, and update it. Um, so it's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. It's storytelling yeah, on different levels. Uh, thank you for a great talk, that's loud. Um, I, I find it really interesting that this most recent and kind of ongoing attempt to send a message out of this world is in digital. It's a digital format, um, especially kind of from our archaeological appro approaches. Um, the fact that we're trying to convey who we are not through objects uh, is really interesting to me. And I'm wondering if you or anyone else who would care to comment sees that as an attempt to move human expression away from the object world? Are, we, are people trying to escape the material as a way to express humanity and our interests? Or is it more just a function of kind of the necessities of you know, having this thing already out in space and that's how we could get information to it? Yeah, interesting question, but I, I don't think it's, 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 it's moving it away from the material world because there is the space probe, you know, there is uh, this memory where it is being recorded in a, you know, and I don't know enough about what digital things look like, but it is zeros and ones and it is, uh, it, it, there is a physicality uh, to that. Um, so it's just a different medium in which, we, um, in which we operate with the material world, a different way of engaging with it. Uh, so it's interesting because it's all encompassing and it brings completely new possibilities and challenges and has a lot of implications in, in, in many ways. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure it's a complete turn away from, from, from what we had before. Of course, another thing which is interesting, again, linking back to story and process, which I also think we should be doing, I'm not quite sure if they will buy that, is uh, since we will be in touch with the space probe for a number of years into the future, you could create a process by which something gets updated re regularly. You could say, I don't know, you choose a particular school somewhere in the world, and every generation will add to the story, Chinese whispers through space. <laughs> 
or something. I think that could be wonderful to, to, to this sort of updating continuity uh, and change, uh, make that part of the process as well. Um, would be possible, and this is uh, the digital technology makes that possible because once you send it physically, you cannot retrieve it again. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cornelius. I, I'd like to add that I, I think this was a, a great closing plenary to kind of complement what was going on about 24 hours ago with uh, Laurent's uh, a keynote address. Uh, and in particular, you mentioned uh, Ulrich Beck and citing uh, risk societies and the idea that technology is the subject of history and not necessarily humanity. And I think you can make a case here for technology as the subject of futures, not necessarily humanity itself. And this kind of addresses uh, Chris's point about the Anthropocene not necessarily be, being anthropocentric. And I think what it kind of brings to mind is the idea that this technological focus is deeply material and therefore deeply archaeological as well and something that we need to address as we move forward and keep these discussions going. And I hope we can do that uh, over the course of dinner and of course uh, over drinks as well. So uh, we'll definitely be setting plans to continue these conversations a little bit later tonight after dinner. So for uh, graduate students and other faculty who are here, uh, please coordinate with us and certainly we can meet up later to continue these conversations. So I can't thank you guys enough. Thank you so much to the participants for being here today. These were really uh, excellent papers. Uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out of this in the end. So thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you for all the audience for your contributions uh, as well with the comments and questions. So again, thanks very much for and being thank here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>